Hi guys, welcome back to Data Every Day. Uh, today we're looking at a data set of forest fires. Um, so it's a bunch of forest fires uh, from a given park, I believe, uh, the uh, Montesino Park. Uh, and we basically have a bunch of features <coughs> about each fire. And at the end um, is a column that says how much of the area in the park was burned, uh, measured in hectares. Uh, and you can see most of them uh, we have zero. So I think these refer to small fires, as it says over here, um, that most of uh, the output variable is skewed towards zero uh, due to small fires, which are the majority. Um, and you can see we do have some values that have uh, greater than zero in here. So what I'm going to do is try to first approach it as a regression task where we try to predict the output um, and then pr uh, approach it as a classification task where we just try to predict if it's zero or not. Uh, and it says this is a difficult regression task. And I found this is true. Uh, very little, there are very few things I could do to improve the, uh, the R squared score of our regression. And the classification does not do as well, uh, do so well either. However, we're going to give it a try. So let's hop into the notebook. Uh, and I'm going to import NumPy and Pandas uh, just to work with the data. And we use the train test split function and S, uh, standard scalar from sklearn for pre-processing. And then we're going to just use uh, four models. Two of them are regression models. Two of them are classification models. Uh, so here are the regressors and here are the classifiers. Uh, then I'm just importing warnings so to keep the notebook clean. All right, let's go ahead and import that and we'll get the data up here. Copy the file path to the CSV file and then load it in using pandas.readcsv. Uh, so let's take a look. We have only 13 columns, uh, and most of them are already encoded for us, uh, but there are two here that are object columns. So let's get a little closer look at the data using data.info, uh, and you can see uh, we have 517 total entries, so it's not a lot of data, um, but you'll notice that in every column we have the maximum number of non-nulls, so there are no missing values in this data set. We can double check that by taking the is and a matrix, which shows if there's true or falses for a given uh, cell, if it's missing or not. And then we can sum over both axes to get the total number of missing values in the data set, uh, which is zero. So let's start pre-processing. So there's not too much we have to do, since we know there's no missing values and we only have two object columns. You can see that here as well. Uh, so I'm going to create a function called preprocess inputs that's going to take in a data frame. It's going to make a copy of the data frame, and then it's going to return the same data frame. Uh, for now, that's all it will do. And we'll get the result down here. I'll store the, the processed version of the data in X, and that will be preprocess inputs. And we're going to pass in the unprocessed version, which is data. So here's X. Currently, it's exactly the same as data. But now, as we add um, preprocessing steps into this function, we'll see the result down here. So uh, the first thing I'd like to do I guess is encode these columns. So let's take a look at them. Um, let's take a look at the month column and the day column. So the kinds of values that are in here, uh, they are categorical features, meaning they're, um, well, each one of these is a category. However, they do take an ordering. Both of these features do take an ordering. So these are called ordinal features. And for ordinal features, the encoding scheme is quite simple. We're basically going to specify an ordering, which we'd like to encode it in, uh, and then change each uh, text label into a numeric equivalent that fits into the order we specify. So up here, I'm going to create a function called ordinal encode. It's going to take in a data frame, a column we'd like to encode, and an ordering for that column. Uh, and it's a very simple function. First, we're just going to create a copy of the data frame. And then we're going to take the column we'd like to encode, uh, and we're going to apply a lambda function to it uh, that takes in some x. In this case, x will be a given value in the column. Uh, and we're going to send x to ordering.index of x. So let's say, OK, let's take the day, for example. Let's say I, I want to order these, right? I want to order these in the right way. So if we have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, uh, Friday, etc. 
Saturday, and I guess we put Sunday at the beginning. Doesn't really matter which we pick first. Um, let's call this our ordering. If we index this ordering uh, with a given value, let's say Friday, we will get back the location or the index within the list or within our ordering. So this uh, formula will send any any uh, text label to its corresponding index, and that is essentially all we have to do um, for ordering, uh, for ordinal encoding. And that's what we've done right here. We're just taking any x and sending it to its index within the ordering. And then when we're done, we're going to return the data frame after that column has been modified. All right. Uh, so now in our pre-process inputs, um, I'm going to ordinal encode the month and day columns. So uh, we'll say df equals ordinal encode, and we have to pass in df, and then our column, which is going to be uh, month, and then our ordering, which will be January, uh, February. You know, you get the idea. Let me just copy this in so I don't have to type it all out. There they are. Uh, this is the order of months uh, that we want. And I'm going to do the exact same thing for the day column. Uh, so I'll just copy that in as well. Uh, you'll see this time all we changed is the column is now day and the ordering is Sunday through Saturday. So now let's return df and see how it looks. And you can see that our month and day columns are now in numerical form. And the mappings have been applied between the text labels and their locations within the ordering. All right, so now the whole column is in numeric form. So we are ready to split and scale the data. So because I'm going to treat this as a regression task and a classification task, what I'm going to do is up here in our preprocess inputs function, I'm going to include this task variable. By default, it will be regression. And down here, uh, if task equals regression, then we want our y, or uh, that's going to be the output variable, what we're trying to predict, our target. Uh, that will be the area column. Uh, we, that's just going to stay the way it is because this is already a continuous valued uh, variable and it's a fit for a regression task. So if we are, our task is regression, y is just going to be the area column. However, if our task is classification, which is the other kind of task we want to do, then y is going to be a little different. It's going to take the area column and apply a function to it. Uh, and so x is a given value in the area column. And we're going to send x to 1 if x is greater than 0. And otherwise, we'll send x to 0. So now x will become either 1 or 0, depending on if this condition is satisfied. And that will create a new column uh, that we'll store in y uh, that will be uh, basically saying if it's a large fire or a small fire. Then our x, which is, this is going to be our big x, this is the remaining data, this is all of our, all of our feature data, so all the other columns beside our target output, uh, that will be df.drop area from axis 1. And now, I, instead I'm g of returning df, I'm going to return x and y. And now in here, we're going to get back x and y, and we're going to specify the task in here. So this is regression. Now our x looks like this. And our y is just the area column, which is no longer present on our x. Now, if I change this to classification, um, our x will stay the same, but now our y will become a binary column of zeros or ones, depending on if we had a zero value in the uh, column originally. Uh, so let's leave it as regression for now. Uh, and let's create our model. So let's, let's do this. We'll say... Um, regression. So I do want to split this into a train and test set. Uh, so what I will do is use the train test split function from sklearn. Uh, this will split x and y, uh, giving, and we'll specify a size of our train set. I'll set it to 70%. So we'll put 70% to the train set and the remaining 30% will go into the test set. And then that will also, uh, this function also shuffles the data. So we're going to include a random state to ensure that the shuffle and therefore the split is always done in the same manner. And so this will split x and y into four new sets, x train, x test, y train, and y test. 
Uh, and then that's what I want to return here instead of just x and y. Uh, so we can get back uh, those four values here and take a look at x train uh, and y train. So this is the same as before, but it's just dealing with 70% of the data. All right, so now we have a train test set. Let's create our model. Uh, the first model I want to do is a simple linear regression model. So I'll call it a linear regression model. That will just be a linear regression. And we're going to fit that model uh, to the train set. So dot fit x train y train. Uh, and we'll print out the results. So uh, linear regression uh, r squared. So uh, by default, um, well, a good metric to use for regression models is the r squared score, which uh, demonstrates uh, it, it's a measure of how dispersed the data is around our fit. So it's a good idea. It's a good gives you a good idea of how the regression model is performing. And I'm going to display it to five decimal places and format that with model. Well, actually, it's linear regression model dot score. And so by default, sklearns dot score uh, function will return the R squared score in the case of a regression model. We just have to evaluate it on the test set. So you pass in the test set, it's going to make predictions on X test, compare them to Y test, and calculate the uh, R squared score, which we'll plug into this print statement. And we end up with an R squared score of 0.02. So the maximum R squared score you can get is 1.0. Uh, which is perfect. You never get that. Um, but it can also uh, go into the negatives if it's a really bad fit. So this is not such a good fit. Um, we could, I, I would hope we could do something better than this, but I tried various methods and um, not everything, anytime I edit, I make any changes to this data set, it actually is decreasing the R squared score. The only thing I could find uh, to make it a little better is to use a little more of a complex model. So this is just a linear model. Uh, this is trying to find a linear relationship between these variables. Uh, but if we want a not to see if there's a nonlinear relationship, uh, we're going to want a little more of a complex model. And one I found that is doing better than a linear model is the neural network. So I'll call this NN regression model. And this is the MLP regressor, for also from sklearn. And I'm going to specify the size of our hidden layers in here hidden layer sizes. Uh, this will be a tuple of uh, hidden layers. I'll give it 16 neurons in each layer, giving it two layers. And then we're also going to fit this to the train set. Dot fit, x train, y train. And I'll copy in this print statement um, and change this to NN regression. All we have to do is, pass, is change that to NN. OK, let's see how this goes. Uh, and that did not work. However, a key, uh, upon retraining, because with the neural network there is an element of stochasticity or randomness, uh, you'll see we get different results each time. But occasionally we do get uh, results that are better than uh, the one we have up here. I'm trying to get one now. Uh, okay, and actually I know why it's not performing so well, and that is because we did not scale the data. So certain models, like a neural network, really prefer uh, scaled data. And what I mean by scaled is right now, um, each of these columns takes on a various uh, varying ranges of values. So I want to standardize the data so they all have the same range of values. And for that, I'm going to use the standard scalar from sklearn, which will give each column a mean of 0 and a variance of 1. There are other scalars you can use. Standard scalar is usually uh, a good go-to. Let me just uh, comment this, split df into x and y, and then here is the train test split. And down here, we're going to scale the feature data, which is x. So uh, we're going to create the scalar object, which is a standard scalar, like I said, and then fit that scalar uh, to just the train set. So you sort of want to assume you only have access to the train set at the time of training, uh, or at the time of pre-processing. So I'm going to transform both the train and test sets uh, using our fit that we uh, just did the train set. So we're going to turn x train into scalar.transform x train, uh, and we're changing x test to scalar.transform x test. And uh, these will return numpy arrays. So if I run this, you'll see we no longer have it as a nice data frame. 
So I'm just going to go back in and change these back into data frames after the scaling has been completed. Uh, and we can keep the column names the same by typing columns equals x.columns. All right, uh, so here is our new data. And you can see now that if we look at the means of each column, they're all extremely close to zero and the variances are all extremely close to one. So they have been scaled and you'll see that our linear regression uh, R squared has not been uh, changed, but our, uh, our neural network regression actually has a better value now and it's more stable, it seems like. Uh, actually got 0.5 there, which is something of an improvement over this. It's not substantial. Um, I really can't find um, any methods that's helping it. Um, if we look at the distribution of values in our Y train. Uh, oh, actually this is a regression task, so it's not uh, no good to do that. Um, but let's look at, I guess let's, let's move on to the classification. So this is our other task. For this, I'm just going to grab that uh, line of code, and all I'm going to do is change the task to classification. So everything under this code block will now be using uh, classification labels. And we can take a look at that. X train will be the same, but Y train will now be a classification column. And I want to see the value counts of this. Uh, so it is actually pretty even, which suggests that up here, um, half, about half of the data is uh, zero, or zero valued, and the other half is greater than zero. So I'm not sure if maybe that's a, a reason we're having a problem uh, getting a good R squared here, or maybe it's just because we have a small number of training examples and a small number of features. Um, but let's try classifying now. So we're going to build two models like we did before, one linear model and one neural network model. So uh, our linear model will be a linear classification model. That's going to be logistic regression. Logistic regression is very similar to linear regression, except we use a, a cost function or loss function that's uh, more suited for a classification task called cross entropy loss or log loss. Um, and we're going to fit this linear classification model to the X train, Y train set, not tr test, train, there we go, X train, Y train. And we can print out the result. Um, so here we have the R squared score, which is fine for a regression task, uh, but for a classification task, it would be better to use accuracy. So linear classification uh, cation accuracy. And accuracy, we're going to display to two decimal places with a percent sign, since it is a percentage value. Um, and we're just going to call linear classification model dot score x test y test. So the score function in the case of a classification model will return the accuracy value. And I'm going to multiply this by 100 since it is a percentage. Um, and we get an accuracy of about 50.64%. So it's really not that good um, because we have, uh, as you saw, we had a class distribution. I um, mean, the zeros and ones, the counts of them are about 50-50. Uh, this is not much better than a random guess. In fact, let's see uh, if we take ytrain.value counts uh, and we, uh, if we want to divide this by the total number in ytrain, so divided by length of Y train, uh, you can see the class distribution here. It is about 52%. So if we built a model that classifies everything as one, we would actually get a better performance than what we're getting with the linear classification. So uh, a baseline model that just guesses one on every example still outperforms this linear classifier, which is not so good. Um, Let's see if a neural network can do a little better. So I'm going to create a neural network classification model that will be the MLP classifier from sklearn. And we're also going to include the same hidden layers sizes here. So I'm going to do 16 and 16 and see if that works. So NN CLF model dot fit uh, again on the train set. And then we'll print out the classification accuracy. But this time it's not linear, it's going to be NN classification accuracy. 
Um, and that did not, oh, sorry, actually, I didn't uh, include, I didn't change this to NN. Okay. Okay, and there we go. So this um, is slightly better than a random guess, or, or slightly better than our baseline model uh, of predicting one each time, because that would give us an accuracy of 52%. So we're doing a little bit better, but it's really not doing the job. So um, if any of you can find a way to improve this model or um, boost the performance of either the regression task or the classification task, please let me know in the comments because I would love to know uh, of a way. But uh, that will conclude today's video. So thank you so much for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell for more content and leave any comments you have in the section below. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a fantastic day.